uh, sitting there at home or here wondering, why is he just sitting there uh, for the entire service? And Rabbi Mason Barkin and Cantor uh, are really outstanding. It was so nice to enjoy Shabbat services all by myself. I had, I had a place all by myself. I got to enjoy listening to the service led by my dear colleagues. Wow, that was fun. And I didn't want to get up um, and take over any part of the service. But I figured I would chat with you a little bit now. And um, it's been a, a custom to, uh, you know, give a little bit of, a, of an apology before we talk about anything political. But I'm not going to apologize tonight because I really know that I do it so rarely. Um, and uh, I promise you that what I'm going to talk about tonight has some Jewish text very much attached, uh, attached to it. But the process and idea of voting and of a democracy is sacred and cherished for us Jews. And that is because for 2,000 years until our ancestors came from primarily Eastern Europe from the 1870s until the 1920s, and for some of you yekas in the 1840s and 50s from Germany, but... I don't know personally that many Yekas. I know mostly Eastern Europeans. Um, this country has been uh, the golden Medina, the golden country, the golden land, um, the place where Jews, up until the establishment of Israel in 1948, uh, is, has been, and God pray, will always be safest for the Jews. So we do not take the democracy that we have for granted, nor do we take America for granted uh, nor should we ever. It would be a Shonda for any Jew to take this country for granted for what it has provided us as a people and as a community since its inception. And fundamental to that is voting. Who would have thought? Our ancestors would never have thought that we would actually be given the opportunity to participate as regular part of society and to vote, and that our votes would be counted uh, whether they were living in shtetls or doing programs or in the uh, uh, Spanish Inquisition or any of the other numerous, way too numerous oppressions of the 2,000 years of Galut, of diaspora. We are the luckiest Jews in the history of the history of the Jewish people because we live in America. So that's the preface. Today is also the, tw I can't believe this when I thought about it, the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. 25 years it's been. I thought when I heard that, oh, it's, it has been 25 years, but indeed it has. It was the year of Zerdain, which was 1995. And it was in November, and it was, I mean, in, in the end of October, it was uh, uh, in Israel, recognized at Rabin Square in Tel Aviv, where I know many of us have visited. And they've been playing reel after reel of that night that night, that awful, awful uh, Saturday night in Tel Aviv, in a square before it was called Rabin Square, um, as Yitzhak Rabin sort of humbly and may he rest in peace though, pathetically sang a beautiful song of peace. Um, and what I mean by pathetic is he, he couldn't sing, let's be honest, he was a little tone deaf and then was minutes after this beautiful song of peace and this beautiful rally in Tel Aviv assassinated. And his words from the White House lawn from just a few months prior to that rang out in my mind when he stood there in front of the world to say, enough, enough, enough war, enough bloodshed, enough. And then was assassinated uh, just a couple of months later. And then I wanted to share two pieces of homework that I have for our congregation and any of your friends and family who wish to that have been posted on Facebook that I posted right before Shabbat services. I was able to participate in two beautiful, wonderful, very Jewish learning sessions this past week. One as co-host and one as just a regular Jew who viewed it. The first was Valley Beit Midrash session as you know, we're a, a, a partner organization with the Valley Beit Midrash program. And this session was hosted by Congregation Beth Israel and featured Rabbi Erwin Kula of the National Center of Jewish Learning and Leadership. And this was this past uh, Wednesday. And the title of that uh, conversation was Beyond Polarization, Judaism and Our Public Culture. 
So homework assignment number one for this weekend, of course, after Shabbat, but I believe during Shabbat, if it's Jewish study, it's kosher. Uh, go to Congregation Beth Israel's Facebook, and you'll see I shared that as homework assignment number one or two. I forgot which one. A wonderful presentation from Rabbi Kula. The second was hosted by Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, which was a conversation. It featured a conversation between Rabbi David Wolpe, who I know a lot of you uh, know. He's always ranked in the top 25 or top 20 most influential rabbis in the country, and a political pollster who happens to be a member of, uh, uh, Temple, of Sinai Temple, uh, uh, political pollster, and he's the, known for his expert wordsmithing, Frank Luntz. And you've seen Frank Luntz probably on all different forms of uh, news programs going over polls, and, and he does a lot of those um, groups where they, they talk about all kinds of issues, um, and he gets their opinions, typically uh, independents or non-committed voters. He runs those focus groups and then talks about it. But uh, you'll get past the first five minutes, which are really annoying because he talks about the Dodgers winning the World Series, and we... We are all as, I think it's an American, oh, your husband, please. I think it's an American cause that unless you're from LA, we don't like the Dodgers, especially if you're from San Francisco. Oh, you're a Dodger fan too. I'm, oh God, see, pass that part where he rubs it in your face, but it's Frank Luntz is, is, for those of you who like him or don't like him, it's a wonderful presentation because he's talking to his rabbi. It's a different lens than I think you will have seen before. So those are your two homework assignments, both on Facebook. Why? Because they do what I'm going to do tonight, what Rabbi Mason Barkin has done in the past, which is sermon uh, homiletics number one, disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Okay. But they're wonderful and they're very Jewish, grounded in, in Jewish text and Jewish ideas, and therefore they're kosher. So those are pre-election homework assignments number one and two. Let's go to the Parsha for this week, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha starts with the most famous words in Torah, other than the Ten Commandments. God says, Lech Lecha, Ma'artzacha, Umi Moladetacha, to Abraham and Sarai, who later become Abraham and Sarah. And these words mean a myriad of things and represent a myriad of ideas that we are still here 3,800 years later, we round up and say 4,000 years later, still grappling with, still studying, still holding on to. Lech lecha, ma'artzacha umimaladetacha. God says, go, get up, leave your homeland, the place which you were born from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Again, this idea that God introduces of telling Abram and Sarai to leave their home and then repeats it by saying, the place of your birth, and then repeats it yet again, sort of keeps doubling down on it and says, the place where you were born, the place that is your home, your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Let's think about this for a second. Two weeks ago in Brashit, didn't turn out so well. God creates the world with the intention of the world being perfect, with the intention of the Garden of Eden being the place where we will dwell and what happens. Adam and Eve get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Cain kills Abel. It's not a happy story. It gets so bad that last week God decides to destroy the entire world. God sort of presses what I call the divine control, alt-delete, and reboots the world with the flood. And then there's the Tower of Babel where the people are trying to become godlike, and God introduces the idea of diversity, and still it's not working. And so this week God decides... In this part, remember as Jews, in our tradition, we believe there were 10 generations between Adam and Noah and 10 generations between Noah and Abram. So this takes a long time for God to figure out. 20 generations, I need a people. I need a nation. I need a goy kadosh, a holy nation, to do the work. Didn't work out so well with Adam and Eve. Didn't work out so well with Noah. Abram and Sarai, I'm going to put all of my faith in them. So after two failed attempts to get it right, God decides that in order to move the world to, toward perfection, toward peacefulness, hope, and a constructive outcome, God needs partners, Abram and Sarah, and us, the Jewish people. And those who will bless them will be blessed, and those who curse them will be cursed. And then, miraculously, 
Abram and Sarai go. They don't ask one single solitary question. They leave their home. They leave their comfort zone. They have enormous faith in the, in the cause and the purpose of their mission, and most of all, in themselves, knowing that it's very likely they will get tested along their journey. It's a long journey from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran, from Haran to Canaan, from Canaan to Egypt, from Egypt back to Canaan. They did a lot of walking. I don't know how many pairs of shoes Abram and Sarai went through. My guess is a lot. And they had test after test after test, challenge after challenge after challenge. They rolled with the punches because they were able to pivot and to be flexible and willing to take risks. The number one risk in Jewish 101 is get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your own head, get out of yourself, unpack all of the messiness inside of you and understand that the world will be filled with and your journey will be filled with lots of tsuris. And the rabbis have an antidote for this. And so let me teach this text. I promise you, this will not last forever, but I'm gonna be here for a couple more minutes. You know in Judaism we have this idea of machloket. Chelek is the root word for machloket, and chelek means a division or a separation. But I like to say it's a good old-fashioned challenge. A chelek, a machloket, is a challenge. It's a challenge of authority, it's a challenge of idea, it's a challenge of opinion, which is why I gave you the two homework assignments that I gave you. And I would say it's safe to say that as Americans right now, we are in the midst of a machloket cubed. A machloket on top of a machloket on top of a machloket. But there are different types of divisions. The rabbis translate machloket as dispute. And in Pirkei Avot, which I know Rabbi Mason Barkin has shared and I have taught you and I'm sure the cantor knows by heart, every machloket, every dispute, the rabbis teach us in Pirkei Avot, is for the sake of heaven, in the end will be permanently established. That is to say, whatever machloket for the sake of heaven, for example, fairness, justice, what these things mean, what fairness and justice are. The idea that God has compassion, but also, also judgment. The idea that we can love someone and be very, very angry with them and even punishing sometimes. These are for the sake of heaven. And those are represented in tradition by the great arguments of Hillel and Shammai. Do we light the menorah from right to left or left to right? Do we start with the eighth candle or the first candles? Those are machlokets for the purpose of heaven or for the sake of heaven. A machloket not for the sake of heaven, really, really in the, in the uh, rabbinic literature, especially in Pirkei Avot, uh, that is not for the sake of heaven, the dispute of Korach and his rebel rousers. Okay, so the idea of a machloket for the sake of heaven, a dispute for the sake of heaven, is a dispute that has a God cause, or a cause that is worthy of God's attention, the menorah, for example, whereas one that is not worthy of God's attention, a machloket that is just flat out wrong, the invalid, that God ignores and isn't divine-like, is one like Korach and his band. And later on in the Midrash, the rabbis give us even a better example of the difference. How do I know the difference? Because it seems sort of arbitrary and abstract to say, well, a machloket or a dispute for the sake of heaven is one that involves the rabbis, the great rabbis, and the one that doesn't is a rebellion, and I can define a rebellion one way or the other, and it may be or it may not be a rebellion, who knows? So what do they say? They say, what is, they dig a little deeper. What is a machloket? What is a dispute for the sake of heaven the rabbis teach? And you'll learn this in one of the homework assignments. For in this world, every dispute, no matter what it is, within us, the evil inclination attempts each person and says that it is for the sake of heaven. That is to say, I believe my cause, my candidate, my proposition, my ideals, they are better than yours and therefore they are for the sake of heaven. Why? Because my inclination to do evil, my evil inclination says, I am right, no matter what, and you are wrong, no matter what, and therefore, because I say so, it's for the sake of heaven. That's where the evil inclination tempts each person and says it's for the sake of heaven. 
the rule of the matter that there is no machloket that does not have within it the evil inclination who is tempting the person and saying, according to the rabbis, that the whole intention is for the sake of heaven and God forbid to say on a particular uh, uh, dis dispute that it is not for the sake of heaven. If so, how can we know whether a person has true good intentions in their argument or bad intentions? The rabbis go on to describe that really a dispute for the sake of heaven is the hardest one to accomplish when we have a dispute with someone, especially over things like politics, policy, fairness, justice. Because really at the end of the day, that's God's domain to define. And as long as we go into a conversation about any topic, knowing lech lecha, where we are at, and understanding that we may get uncomfortable, we may be out of our comfort zone, that we may have to actually leave home, so to speak, in order to get home, has to be based in love. The rabbis conclude this idea of what's a good dispute versus a bad dispute by saying, like the machloket of Shammai and Hillel, who loved each other. Shammai and Hillel had the worst arguments in the Jewish tradition. They actually said, I can't even define the word, it's, a, it's an Aramaic word. There's this word in the Talmud, et maha, to each other, which kind of is, the best definition is question mark, explanation, question mark, but it means something else that I can't sh share at a PG-13 event. That's for the sake of heaven. Why? Because fundamentally, Shemai and Hillel loved each other and respected one another as friends and as lovers. The rabbis teach that is a sign that their disagreement was for the sake of heaven. Our disagreements can be for the sake of heaven, or I would argue for the sake of our country and of our democracy, if we love each other, if we respect the other. I don't like the trite term that we agree to disagree so much because it seems like an easy way out, but it's fun and good and kosher and safe to say to someone, I fundamentally disagree with you, but I don't hate you. My disagreement does not mean that I'm going to hate you. Abram and Sarai are, are archetypes of this. They have dispute after dispute after dispute, whether it's with Lot and his group, or the Pharaoh in Egypt, or the others, even God. Abraham has a dispute with God over Sodom and Gomorrah because they are foundationally in love and not from hate, those disputes are for the sake of heaven. The rabbis, again, just to finish up, however, the machloket of the dispute of Korach and his company, where they were holding out enmity and hatred and almost stoned Moses and the like, this is not for the sake of heaven. And this is what worries me. The arguments that we are having with each other are not for the sake of heaven. Why? Because of the hatred that is not only being spewed, but is the intention on both sides, on both sides. And one of the things you'll see in homework assignment number two that Frank Luntz shows you is these very scary charts where you've got 90% plus of one party and 90% plus of the other party in these disputes for the wrong reasons. What are the wrong reasons? Enmity, hatred, shaming, putting down, making less human. Those are the things on both sides. So where does this leave us? I think it's important before Tuesday that we think about our plan for Tuesday night and Wednesday and most likely Thursday, depending on how things go with Florida. I wanna give you a Jewish thought and I want you to be like Abram and Sarai and this is for everyone at home too. Number one, American history and the American future is bigger than any one person or one election. I understand how consequential we all feel this election is. I get it. I think we can all agree it's a pretty consequential election. But please don't forget that American history and our future as a country are much bigger than one person and one vote. Vote. And I believe through Jewish eyes, we know that because as Jews, with a 4,000 year history, we can draw upon the strength of Abraham and Sarai and understand that one side or the other is gonna feel very much outside of their comfort zone. People are saying it won't be my country anymore and the country will be destroyed and there will be a civil war, which leads to number two. Don't talk like that in front of our children or your grandchildren. 
Our children and our grandchildren are watching and guess what? They are filled with anxiety and stress and they're scared. Why? Because of COVID and how their parents have reacted and responded to that. And two, because their parents and grandparents with certainty have told them whether they mean to or not in front of them or they've overheard. And we know this from our religious school kids and we know this from our confirmants and high school kids that were here last night. We have kids whose parents are telling them to make sure they have a full tank of gas on Tuesday. Like they're gonna go to Canada or Mexico on Tuesday. We have parents who are saying in front of their kids that our nation will be destroyed if X candidate wins and X candidate loses, that our country will be ending. Please don't talk like that in front of your children and grandchildren. A, developmentally, they don't get it. And B, fundamentally and developmentally, they take it seriously. They actually believe what you're saying in real time. And the third thing is, let's all remember what it means to be blessed to be Americans. Can we as Jews at least say that it is worth our while to love this country because of what this country has provided us as a community? Were it not for America, were it not for the idea of the more perfect union that welcomed Jews in the millions in the late 19th century, and early 20th century, we wouldn't be here. We simply wouldn't be here. And it's arguable that we would still be suffering in other parts of the world. And it's arguable that our ancestors would have died in the Holocaust had they not been able to come, three million of them, in that 40, 50 year period. So we love this country. We are grateful for this country. We be lo feel lucky to be here. Let's act like that. And know that starting Wednesday and Thursday, we're gonna have to have some various serious conversations with our friend and our friends and our family. I pray about recalibrating recalibrating how we approach machloket, conflict, so that we can at least come to the resolution that we love our country and we love our fellow Americans because that is patriotism. I love America and I refuse to hate Americans. That's the Jewish message. I wanna end tonight with these words because I find that they are especially meaningful and especially healing and especially helpful during painful times. On April 4th, 1968, during his campaign for the Democratic nomination, Senator Robert Kennedy had the very unfortunate and untimely duty of sharing the news of the assassination with Martin Luther King Jr. with a group of supporters in Indianapolis. It was so dangerous in this neighborhood in Indianapolis that the mayor of Indianapolis refused to give a police escort to Senator Kennedy on his way to speak to his supporters. And in fact, it was so kerfuffled, I don't know if that's the official language, so kerfuffled he didn't even have time to sign off on a draft of his comments. And because it had just happened, the assassination, he spoke off the cuff on the flatbed of a truck in the most dangerous neighborhood in Indianapolis to a primary, primarily black audience without a police escort to tell them the news. With the courage of his convictions, he stood on that flatbed truck, again, descendant of immigrants, Irish immigrants to the United States, and he announced the assassination. And you can hear the gas and the screams and the cries. Knowing how polarized the United States was at that time, he spoke from his heart, off the cuff, no notes, as I just said. And it was in five to six minutes that he spoke in terms of white and black from within the civil rights era. But I believe that the terms white and black can easily extend to our context today beyond race, beyond ethnicity. Maybe we can think of it as people who think in terms of black and white or people who think in terms of partisanship before a country when we hear. His message resounds today as it did then as we can decide whether we, like Abraham and Sarai, want to walk together, lech lecha, out of our comfort zone and into the wilderness, because our country is very much in a wilderness right now, in some small measure after next Tuesday's election, toward the potential that is America that we aspire toward, a more perfect union, which is to say, one that is not yet perfect.
Therefore, with a sense of acute uncertainty of what the coming week holds for us and with the humility of knowing that as a country we have been here before, I want to conclude with Senator Kennedy's thoughts from that tragic and terrible night in 1968. And my prayer is that in hearing these words, these ideas will ring true today and remind us of what it really means to be Americans. And here's what Kennedy said. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of nation we are and what direction we want to move. For those of you who are black, you can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country. In great polarization, black people amongst black, white people amongst white, filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that has spear spread across our land with an effort to understand with compassion and love. We have to make an effort in the United States, he went on. We have to make an effort to understand, to go beyond these rather difficult times. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. The vast majority of people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings who abide in our land. Let us dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. May we, with these words in our own hearts, dedicate ourselves to that. Lech Lecha. Shabbat Shalom.